genotype for an extra allele? Yes. All right. Could you tell us which ones? Well, none of these particular samples were typed as having a four allele. But you can see here, uh, and if you bring it up a little further, I think it's clearer that you can see a four dot here confirmed by the 1.2, 1.34 dot here. And that's on this particular sample. And it's also on this particular sample here. And it's on this particular sample here. In this case, there's a dot uh, present because this was a 1.2. Now, what does the existence of uh, uh, what does the existence of the four lighting up at 261-4 and the 1.3 dot lighting up at 261-4 in that strip, and the four and the 1.3 the 1. 2, 3, 4 dot lighting up on the 261-6 strip. What are those, what's the significance of that? Well, the significance of those weak dots are that there really should not be more than two alleles here. That represents a third allele. These samples came from a database, uh, presumably from single individuals, and uh, therefore that represents human DNA that shouldn't be there and that's what our definition of contamination is. And that holds, I take it, also for 261-7? Yes. All right. Now, if we move back a little bit. <clears throat> uh, focusing on another part of the sheet. How did LAPD what observations did they make with respect to uh, some of these samples in terms of that four? They, they recorded the presence of those, but didn't incorporate them into their typing result. So in other words, uh, in the fourth so strip down see. there, you're pointing that they recorded as a 1.1 with a four. Is that correct? Correct. And And uh, in the seventh strip down, again, those it, and what does that nomenclature indicate? Four less than C. It indicates that there was a four dot observed, but it was less than the control dot. And the control dot, if you remember, is the dot that determines whether or not there was a, an adequate amount of DNA to proceed with typing. Now, in your opinion, does the fact that that four is less than the control dot, does that mean that the, the, uh, those fours are not contaminants? Absolutely not. Why? Because of there are a number of possible explanations as to why you would have that additional dot. And there are no known descriptions of that particular dot, the four dot, having what are known as cross hybridization problems. And so the only explanation for that particular dot is that it's a real, not an artifact, and that that dot represents additional human DNA. So in other words, additional human DNA, that four dot means that those samples are contaminated in some fashion somehow. It does. Uh, now, did you, going through strips that you looked at, and I asked that this be marked as, uh, what's next in order? 1288. 1288. <clears throat> Your Honor, if I make a request is that, uh, uh, to expedite this, could we uh, reconfigure the arrows on the typing strip at the break? Yes. And then print it out? Yes. All right, should we give that a number, and I'll make sure to do that? Uh, yes, should be uh, 1286A. 1286A. Right, and we'll do that with Mr. Clark at the break. And so this would be 1288s. Now, did you... Did 
did you conduct a Did you prepare a, a chart indicating in all the samples you looked at that the LAPD from the validation studies, the Korean database, uh, the proficiency tests and the case scores, all the strips you looked at, how many times you saw a four allele in a known sample that, uh, where it shouldn't be, which in your opinion was contamination? I did. All right. And could you ex please explain what this <clears throat> chart represents? Well, this represents a... Uh, a graphical picture of that. Uh, beginning in, in May, what we see is that they really didn't experience it initially. Uh, I didn't observe anyway these extra four dots. Well, before, you, before you leave there, just so we understand what we're talking about, when, it, when that box says 5 slash 93 and underneath it 0 slash 32, what does that represent? Uh, this, this is uh, May of 1993, and under here are the number of uh, typing strips I looked at and how many times I found that 4 as an ad additional dot. All right, so. And then this represents the percentage, which would be calculated from this and then displayed. So if I could move through it quickly then, 593, you nothing. looked at 32 strips, nothing. 693, 50 strips, nothing. 793, 56 strips, nothing. 893, one out of 38. And 993, now nine out of 136. And 1093, there were five out of 97. In 1193, there were two out of 11. In 1293, zero out of 17. January of 94, 18 out of 50. February, zero out of eight. March, one out of five. April, 18 out of 46. May, four out of 45. Uh, June, one out of 16. July, one out of 12. And August, 10 out of 61. And then if we pull back and look at the chart, as a whole, you then looked at those absolute numbers and created a simple bar graph of what that rep, rep, what this four allele contaminant represented. Correct. As a percent. Correct. All right. And as far as the four allele is concerned, when you see an extra four allele, there's no question in your mind that's a contaminant. It has to be contamination. And I'd like to look at. Uh, but it has to be marked as, uh, <clears throat> that's 1288, this would be 1289. All right, 1289. Did you do a similar analysis for the 1.2 allele? Yes. All right, now what is the 1.2 allele in the strip? Is there any particular dot for the 1.2 allele? No, there isn't a specific probe for this particular allele. Uh, you depend upon the, the 1.2, 1.34 dot and interpret it in, in context of the other dots to make a decision as to whether it's really a 1.2 or not. So did you perform a similar analysis in terms of numbers of strips and percentages whenever you saw an additional 1.2 allele on a known sample? Yes. All right. And this table represents that? Yes. All right. And whenever you see a 1.2 allele, an extra 1.2 allele, in your opinion, is that definitely contamination? It's definitely contamination. I asked to mark what is 1290. Did you do a similar analysis for the number two allele? I did. And does this chart represent that? It does. All right. And uh, it's a percentage analysis as well as the absolute analysis. That's correct. Uh, and just to move in just to give us a sense of it. For example, in January of 1994, you're seeing what there? 20 out of 50 uh, strips, which whatever percentage that is. And uh, in uh, February, there was zero out of eight, um, two out of five in March, uh, 17 out of 46 in April, two out of 45 in May, et cetera. Et cetera. Right. Now, It has to mark this as 
Defense 1291. So marked. This would be an analysis of the three of them. Correct. And uh, I take it that uh, they don't seem to have too much of a problem with the three allele. There's only one observation that was made, uh, or I can't read it. I believe it's two. Three out of 61. Or three out of 61, yes. Right. Mm. When you see a three allele, is there any doubt in your mind an extra three allele that that's contamination? It's definitely contamination. Right. <clears throat> now, are there certain, what is, a, what is known as a, what is an artifact in this uh, DQ alpha system? It's, it's a result a uh, mistaken result that's as a, re as a result of a flaw in the system. All right. Now, is there some, uh, in other words, that's a, you, you see a dot that is uh, a result of some defect in the system. And it's Correct. Not a limitation of the typing system itself uh, has created that signal so that uh, you can't really determine if it's real or not. Mr. Sheck and Dr. Gertius, please, you can't talk at the same time. Is there a, uh, uh, with the 1.1 allele, is there sometimes uh, something that arises as an artifact? Yes. Right. Do you have something from the user guide that can uh, demonstrate that for us? I believe so. Gave it to you. <laughs> and I ask that this be marked as 1291. We focus in on the uh, strips no, uh, seven and eight there. Now, what does this uh, illustrate, Doctor? Can you uh, focus that a little better and get it enlarged a little better? <clears throat> These two strips represent a typing in which you have a, a classic example of what is known as the DX gene. Uh, and that is an artifact in this particular typing system. It's a limitation of this system. And it occurs when you have alleles other than the one. So here we have a two and a three, for instance, in both cases. And uh, the C dot is, is found. And there's, you can barely see it, but there's a 1.1 here in both of these strips. Now is that one? Here. Right, and here. Okay. All right. Now, is that, no, maybe we should have Mr. Harris do that. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> uh, why don't you put another what dot on the other one, 1.1 1. 1 there. Okay, 1.1 1. 1 there. And could you write on the upper left-hand side of the top of the chart DX? Do we know how to do that? Uh, I believe so. Now, <laughs> the, the, I take it then when you see a light 1.1 dot, but
but no one dot <clears throat> on the far left-hand side. Is that correct? That's correct. That is what you call a classic DX. Yes. And what, what is, if you can, very, very simply, just tell us what that is. Why does that happen? Well, the explanation is that there's a, another gene that's similar enough to the DQ alpha gene to have some of the probe signal, uh, to give some probe signal on that particular dot. And so if you have a lot of DNA, and by the literature that means greater than six nanograms of DNA, you can sometimes see this artifact. Now, <clears throat> let's assume that in these two instances that we're looking at where the arrows are pointing, uh, those are the expected genotype from that sample is a two and a three, right? Correct. Because the two and a three dots are lighting up. That's correct. Let's assume for uh, that the real genotype that you're typing is a 1.3, 2, or some other allele, uh, a 1.3 or a 1 that would light up the one dot on the left-hand side. Okay. And you also saw a 1.1 dot. Yes. Could you tell whether that was the DX or a contaminant? No. Couldn't determine Be either way. Because the, the definition of DX requires that uh, you have actually two probes here. One, the one dot confirms that there's actually a one there. So if there is another allele there that is a one, that dot will light up, and now the 1.1 is really confirmed by that first dot, and so you can't make a decision, a scientifically sound decision, unless you do additional testing, sequence it, or do something else. Because in that particular setup, it could be a DX, or it could be a real allele. Well, is it a good thing in terms of a typing system to have this kind of possible DX artifact that confuses mm -hmm. interpretation? No, the problem with this is if it's from one individual, you can sometimes, as in this case, make an excuse that that 1.1 is just an artifact. But if it's in a forensic sample and you don't know it's from one person, now you can no longer decide is that real or is that due to a mixture, and especially in a situation where you have that one dot. Now, when you went through the DOJ typing strips, uh, did you do an analysis of instances where you found uh, extra 1.1 alleles? I did. <laughs> now, could we print this out from the MLM? Yes. Did I did. <laughs> At an appropriate time, Ryan, I'd ask to pass it to the jury because I understand that it's, in terms of seeing the light dots, it's easier on this one than it is on the monitor. I don't Can know. you see it right now from that 1292 that you have? Is it clear on what the Elmo has printed out there? I, I, yeah, I think you can see it on the, what the Elmo has printed out. All right, let's do it now since if we do it later, the jury may not recollect what, what this relates to.
fair to describe. Uh, sorry, excuse me, I'm sorry, Counselor. The record should reflect that the uh, jury has each, each member of the jury has had an opportunity to view 1292A. And uh, would 1292? A. A? A. Uh, now, would 1292A be described as the <coughs> classic DX, right? That's the classic example that's used to uh, show this artifact phenomenon, yes. How many times in your analysis of the uh, looking at extra 1.1 alleles did you see the classic DX without a one dot? Of, of the alleles that were counted as 1.1 extra dots, 7.6% of those were due to this classic kind of example. And uh, would that be uh, 9 out of 46? Yes. All right. Now, <coughs> what's the uh, next one? I'm sorry. 1293. 1293. 1293. <coughs> yes, 1293. Did you chart in the same manner that you did? Uh, did you create a chart of? extra 1.1 <coughs> dots that you saw. Yes. And uh, is this that chart? It is. This again is representing May through August of 1994. Correct. So what you're telling us is that uh, nine of these 1.1s were the classic DX. Correct. And the rest of them were 1.1s where there were one dots present. Correct. Where you, where it could be a contaminant. Correct. Or uh, and we would call the classic DX an artifact. Correct. All right. Now, with respect to the <coughs> 1.3 dot, did you compile a similar chart of your observations of all the strips? I did. And I'd ask to mark this 1294. Now, <coughs> The 1.3 allele, when you see an extra 1.3 allele, are there situations where that could be an artifact as opposed to a contaminant? Yes, it's been observed and described in the literature that on this particular allele, if you use DNA concentrations greater than six nanograms, you can see faint signals on that particular dot. Is it your understanding that the uh, samples in question were uh, contemplated to have as much as six nanograms, the ones that you looked at? Uh, some of these may have, yes. All right. Uh, <clears throat> does this represent the number of 1.3 alleles that you saw? It does. When you're looking at a forensic case and you see a 1.3 allele, an extra one, and the sample has less than six nanograms of template DNA, uh, what is the best interpretation of that? If it's less than that amount of DNA, the best interpretation is that it's, it is a true contaminant. Okay. It's extra DNA. Now, did you, <coughs> now I'd like to turn to the larger chart. Did you do a compilation of all those individual allele charts, pulling them all together to look at all the strips that you examined. And this is, what did we mark this as? 1287. On uh, 1287, did you do an overall chart indicating what you found in terms of uh, contamination and the uh, artifacts you described, the, the seven yes. DXs, uh, over this period between May of 1993 and August of 1994? I did. And this represents absolute numbers and percentages? Correct. Um, <laughs> now, did you also look at what what are known as runs? Yes. Or what is a run as opposed to these strips? On a given day, you will test 
a series of strips. It can be a minimum of perhaps eight or as many as uh, 30 or 40. But on a given day, if you look at all of those strips, that's called a run. Now, did you do, so in other words, these are the individual strips by month. Those are the individual strips. And did you compile an analysis of runs, all the strips in a day, uh, to see whether or not there was a definite contaminant uh, on a run that didn't represent an artifact in any way? I did. All right. I'd like to take a look at that. Please describe for the jury what this chart represents. So this represents. Oh, I have to mark this. But this would be 12. 1295. 1295. And this would be a chart entitled Runs Percent with Contamination by Month, May 1993 through August of 1994. Correct. All right. Could you please describe what this represents? Well, it's titled Percent with Contamination now not contamination and or artifact. So what I would do is if you look at all the strips that are done on a given day, if you, you can look at those in the context of one another and make a scientific decision as to whether or not this is true contamination or not. And the kinds of things that would convince you that it's contamination is let's say, for instance, I found a weak 1.1 on one strip that might be DX, might be an artifact, but if I also found a one dot on the no DNA control on that same day, and I found a one dot on the extraction control on that same day, and I found that same 1.1 one, one, 1 .1 1 dot on other strips that had ones where I can't make a decision, if you look at that all in context, and look at the whole pattern, it's, you can confirm that this is, this is not just a random thing that happens at a low percentage of the time due to this DX artifact, it's really contamination. Well, these charts represent, let's, let's just take in May, when, in, uh, May of 1993, there were two runs, but you didn't see any contamination in that run in that laboratory. That's correct. They started in May, and they did 45 strips, if I remember correctly. None of those strips showed any indication of the kinds of things we're talking about as either artifacts or <coughs> contamination. All right, and then, and that represents two runs. That's only two days, that's right. And then and all of a sudden, June of 1993, what happens? Well, they did four runs, four different days they did typing strips, viewing each of those in the context of one another. Two of them were confirmed that now they have the presence of contamination in the lab. And we're talking about this is contamination in negative controls, or the four allele, three allele, 1.2 allele, and the 1.1 1. 1 under circumstances where you can confirm it's definitely but contamination and not an artifact. That's correct. By the criteria I mentioned earlier, where I can definitely uh, confirm that this is contamination, not one of these artifacts. Now, as a DNA laboratory director, when you start seeing on the runs in June of 1993 that 50%, uh, what would that be, 50%, uh, 50% 50 50 of contamination, as a laboratory director, what do you do when you're dealing with this PCR system? Well, anyone who's worked with this system for any given amount of time, you become extremely paranoid about this problem. So if your controls show any indication and I mean any indication of contamination, what you do is you shut down, you bleach, you clean, you make all your reagents over, you run a large series of control strips, make sure they're clean, and then you start over if that, all of that works. Is if you don't do that and you just ignore the contamination, is there a problem because this is chronic and accumulates? 
yes, if you don't identify the source of the contamination and remove it, it stays in the <coughs> laboratory. And you don't know where it is, and it's going to come, it will become evident on a sporadic and random basis initially, but eventually it will tend to build up. And I didn't point it out on those other strips, but you can see a buildup from 93 to 94 in the, the occurrences. You can see it here as well on the, on the run strip. That it started with nothing, all of a sudden they have 50, now they're up to 66% uh, or two thirds of the strips. And, and on some months- Two thirds of the runs. Or the runs. And on some months it goes all the way up so that all of the runs are contaminated. Uh, now, when you're finding contamination like this, it could be from any of a number of sources or procedures? Yes. And is what you're saying that should laboratories document um, contamination? In my opinion, it's absolutely uh, uh, imperative. Should you document the steps that are taken to correct the contamination problem once you have it in your laboratory? Yes. How important is that? Uh, I think it's extremely important. In fact, there are forensic guidelines that state that that <coughs> is a, a recommendation that they should do, that they should actually do that in forensic <laughs> labs. We do it in research labs. Can you labs stop right there? Labs. You say a forensic guideline. What are you talking about? It's called a twig dam guidelines. And it stands for the Technical Working Group of DNA Analysis Methods. Um, I mean, it's just basic sound laboratory practice that if you can te detect the amount of contamination that you saw on the runs at the LAPD right away, that you have to document it and document all the steps that ought to be taken to correct it. You should document that it happened, document what you did to fix it, document what you did to determine it's been removed from the lab, and then proceed. And could this contamination also come simply from the methods that you use to handle samples? Excuse me, objection calls for speculation. Sustained. All right. Does contamination arise from sample handling methods? Objection, no foundation. Sustained. All right. In your experience uh, as a DNA laboratory director, uh, what are the various sources of contamination problems, such as the ones you saw here at the LAPD? Well, as I've described that already, you can have introduction of foreign DNA by uh, handling a specimen in such a way that you're not careful that you can't get transfer of DNA from one sample to another. So if you're working in this case with these samples are known to come from single individuals, that's one possible explanation as to how it got there is you have you handled it you know in a sloppy manner and you've accidentally introduced somebody's DNA into that particular sample during the process of, uh, of preparing it and handling it. now now just in terms of the strips of, of, the, of the samples that you were looking at you were you were looking at known samples from these validation studies is that correct yes you were looking at samples as part of a database where the laboratory receives uh, a single blood sample has to type it. Correct. You were looking at the positive controls on casework, correct? Correct. Now, those are not supposed to be, I take it, degraded samples or mixtures. No, those are going to be the easiest possible sample to type. You've got a lot of DNA there, or adequate DNA certainly, uh, and they should be defined from single individuals. So the analysis of contamination that you've just presented to us is based upon known exemplars or easy samples. Yes. Uh, or actually, I think it's probably good before I get to the May through July charts. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our uh, recess for the uh, lunch hour. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves. Don't form any opinions about the case. Don't conduct any deliberations until the matter has been submitted to you. Don't allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. We'll stand in recess until 1.30. All right, Dr. Uh, Gertie, you're ready to come back at 1.30.
back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter. All parties are again present. The jury is not present. All right, Deputy Magnar, let's have the jury, please. Dr. Gerties, would you uh, resume the... All right, let the record reflect that we've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Uh, Dr. Gerties, would you uh, resume the witness stand, please? All right, the record should reflect that Dr. John Gerties is on the witness stand undergoing direct examination by Mr. Sheck. Uh, good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon. Uh, doctor, you reminded, sir, you are still under oath. Mr. Sheck, you may continue with your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Uh, Your Honor, we uh, showed Mr. Clark over lunch uh, the printout uh, from that I think we designated Korean database for contaminant that we didn't print before, uh, and that is 1286A. So noted. And I'd like to put that back for a second on the Mr. Harris. <clears throat> Sir, uh, hmm. Now, Dr. Gertie's, uh, this was the, uh, uh, set of strips from the Korean database where you identified for us before uh, the four contaminant in those known samples. Is that yes, right? Yes, that's right. Now, let me call your attention to the very top strip. Uh, what strip is that? That's the negative amplification control. And in this instance, the negative amplification control, did that show any contamination or any dots on it? No, it did not. Yet. On these set of strips, you've identified contaminating alleles in samples. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, well, doctor, it, how could it be that you have contaminants on the strip, but the negative control doesn't show any foreign DNA? Well, this is, is well known, has been described in the National Research Council, and obviously I've observed it in my review of the strips from the LAPD and it basically has to do with the fact that when you have contamination and it's at a it's at a low level of contamination you can find situations where it's not necessarily going to find its way onto those all of the control strips so in this particular case we can see that it's present in the items but it's not present on the strip so in terms of the control strip would it be fair to say in terms of these methods that just because controls are negative for one set of experiments, that doesn't mean that the specimen strips aren't contaminated? That's true. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the National Research Council report. Do you have that book in front of you? Yes, I do. That is the study DNA technology and forensic science from the National Research Council? Yes. Um, and uh, this reference that you made, would that be on page 67? or one of the places that this phenomenon is mentioned? All right. Do you uh, rely upon uh, the National Research Council? Let me direct your attention to page 67 of that document. Okay. All right. Do you rely upon this as a, an authoritative scientific test with respect to uh, the issues of uh, 
uh, <coughs> contamination in forensic PCR applications. Yes. All right. Uh, can I have this? Uh, I've shown this to the council. Can I have this uh, page be marked as? 1296. <coughs> Is this page, is that an uh, accurate reproduction of the uh, section you just referred to you in your testimony as uh, uh, one of the conclusions of the National Research Council? Yes, it is. Right. Your Honor, may I put that in the Elmo and... <clears throat> Before we leave this, I'm, I'm sorry. Could you, uh, uh, Mr. Harris, could you mark, uh, could you direct Mr. Harris to mark the top strip, which you identified as the negative control, where there was no contamination, it was clean, but on the set of strips where there was nonetheless contamination on the specimens. That would be the top one? That would be the very top strip, yes. Uh, could you mark that, Mr. Harris, on the left-hand side, NC? All right, and could we print this out as, uh, or can we can we leave? What was that 1286B? 1286B. Doctor, was this the uh, paragraph you were referring to? Yes, it is. All right. Now, uh, it says, moreover, it should rem be remembered that controls are useful for monitoring general contamination in a laboratory, not the accuracy, of, excuse me, of a particular experiment. Excuse me, I'm going to enter an objection to your statement at this point. A little late at this point. Is, is the National Research Council report in this section, uh, are these conclusions the kind of data that uh, DNA scientists in your field uh, uh, rely upon in forming conclusions with respect to scientific matters? No foundation. Uh, this NRC report represents a, a report that was uh, put together by uh, a panel of respected scientists and uh, is uh, well known to be the consensus opinion at the time it was published and is relied upon. Do you re have you relied upon the NRC report in this uh, particular section uh, in forming your opinions uh, uh, with respect to this case and on the issue of forensic DNA typing? It's one aspect of, of the foundation for my opinions, yes. That is fine. Get back now. It says, moreover, it should be remembered that controls are used for, for monitoring general contamination in the laboratory, not the accuracy of a particular experiment. If a blank control is positive in one experiment, it indicates a potential problem, not just for that experiment, but for any experiment uh, performed at about the same time. Now, if I could stop right there, when they use the term experiment, uh, how does that relate in terms of these uh, PCR strips? What are they referring to? Well, each, uh, uh, each, each, you could look at it in two ways, really. Each strip could be called an experiment or the entire run would be an experiment. So, so. when they're saying that uh, the accuracy of a particular set of strips uh, yes. or ex uh, a ex particular experiment um, that one set of strips uh, withdrawn. When they say here, if a blank control is positive in one experiment, it indicates a potential problem not just for that experiment, but for any experiment performed at about the same time. Now, 
a blank uh, positive control, a blank control there, is that what we've been talking about as negative controls? Yes. All right. So if a negative control is positive in a certain period when typing is done, uh, what are they saying with respect to the potential for contamination on other sets of strips where the controls are negative? They're saying that, that just because that one, if you have one strip that shows or any indication of, of contamination, that can't be interpreted that another experiment that was done on the same day or around the same time pe period even, you can't assume now that the laboratory is clean because this is a random, sporadic process. Uh, you can't automatically assume that just because the other strip is clean that the entire run that was associated with that clean strip uh, might not be contaminated. And it goes on to say that even in a laboratory contaminated with PCR carryover, blank controls do not necessarily become contaminated on every occasion. It would be wise to repeat all work with samples that have never been exposed to the PCR typing laboratory. Now, when they say exposed, wh what in your judgment does that mean? Well, it means exactly what it says, and that is it can't, that the sample can't, uh, should not have even entered the doors of that laboratory. All right. It goes on to say, in view of the problem of contamination due to handling and carryover, laboratories must incorporate contamination control into their standard operating procedures and outbreaks of contamination and the steps taken to correct the problem should be documented. Do you agree with that? I do. <clears throat> For your findings, referring here to 1295. Your findings is represented here on 1295 in terms of runs contaminated at the LAPD. Does this represent outbreaks of contamination in your judgment? Definitely. And uh, in terms of documentation, and I bring you back here for one second to uh, 1296A. The uh, Korean database with the four contaminants uh, with the negative control came out blank. Now, did the analysts from the LAPD record the presence of a weak four allele, or what you're calling the contaminant allele, on these strips? Uh, the analysts recorded three of those, yes. So in other words, and in, when you were finding uh, what you've uh, identified as contaminants on these runs. Uh, it, in about what percentage of the times would the analysts from the LAPD actually write down or note on the sheet the presence of the contaminant allele? Excuse me, objection assumes facts, not in evidence. Sustained. Also, also no foundation. Sustained. Well, how many times would you see in the records of these strips uh, that the LAPD analyst would write down and identify the presence of what you calling the extra allele? Same objection as the foundation. Sustained. Well, wh when you looked at these sheets of paper, would you see written on it uh, an indication of the presence of the, what you've called the extra allele? Yes. All right. And uh, about what percentage of the time would there be on those documents uh, written down an indication of that extra allele. Objection, no foundation. All right, I'll allow this subject to a foundation for the source of these documents to be right. laid later. Uh, I don't recall the exact percentage, but I'd say somewhere between 85 and 90 percent of the time the allele was recorded. Right. Now, would it be fair to say then that there was at least a record in the laboratory of what you're calling the contaminant allele? Yes. All right. 
Uh, was there any documentation that you saw on these sheets, these typing sheets, of uh, recording an outbreak of contamination? And did you receive any documents from them indicating steps taken to correct it? Objection vague. Oh. Uh, there was one occasion when it was documented in the notes that the uh, contamination was recognized and recorded. Other than that, no. <coughs> Now, moving to the period of testing in this case, Shapiro, would you flip that to chair down, please? Thank you. Thank you. Did you find? All right, have we marked this, Mr. Ray? No, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just less should than be 1297. 1297. Uh, this chart. Um, Dr. Gertie's, uh, this chart is entitled Runs and Strips, per Percent of Contamination and or Artifact. Uh, and uh, it indicates below May, June, and July. Uh, what year is that? 1994. All right, could you uh, do me a favor, and I apologize for the chart making. Could you write on the top of this? Uh, May through June 1994, right? Uh, right after it says artifacts. Now, the period May through, uh, <laughs> I asked you to write down May through June, and it has July on it. Oh. <laughs> well, you did what you asked. All right. <laughs> well, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I mean, let the record reflect I corrected it to July. Now, Dr. Gertie, is May through July of 1994, the period bracketing uh, the testing done in this case? It is. All right. And did you see essentially the uh, uh, results consistent with your overall findings of contamination in the laboratory during this period? Yes, the contamination persists through that period. I'd like to mark this. 1298. 1298. Uh, and this chart is entitled Percent of Contamination by Control, May through July 1994. Uh, now, Dr. Gertie's, what does this chart represent? Uh, in this particular chart, we look at the negative controls and ask the question uh, where do we find uh, contamination in? those, and you'll recall those particular controls that have no dot at all, no indication of DNA, because they, they represent uh, a negative control, meaning no DNA control. Now, you indicated that there are two kinds of negative controls used at the LAPD. One, uh, extraction controls, and the other one, negative amplification <coughs> controls. Yes. All right, and uh, your, this chart represents, is it your finding that 10 out of 25 negative amplification uh, extraction controls 
were contaminated during the period May through July of 1994. Yes. And no zero of seven or no negative amplification controls were contaminated. That's correct. Now, what does that indicate about the source of the contamination or what phase of the DNA testing process would be the source of uh, the contamination based on these findings? Objection, no foundation calls for speculation. Sustained. Right. What, what is the, uh, at what phase of the DNA pro uh, testing process uh, would there be contamination in an extraction control? The extraction control is a, as, a, as you recall, is where the uh, analyst will use a, a control swab or a piece of cotton cloth and then go through the entire manipulation and DNA extraction procedure. So it's going to be a control that will detect uh, human DNA that shouldn't be there during that manipulation stage and during the DNA extraction stage. So would it be fair to say from your findings in the period of May through July of 1994 that the contamination of the controls was occurring during the sample handling and extraction phase of the DNA process? That's correct. I'm sorry, objection. No foundation calls for speculation. Overruled. Dr. Gerdes, <clears throat> in your review of other forensic laboratories, have you made assessments of uh, the existence or non-existence of contamination? I have. In any of the 23 laboratories whose work you've reviewed and the seven laboratories that you visited, based on the data you've seen, have you seen any how does the LAPD rate in terms of levels of contamination? No Sustained. All right. In looking at uh, other laboratories, what data have you had to assess uh, the existence or non-existence of contamination? I've had uh, the, con the strips for the incident case that I was looking at plus the controls that were run around that time. Have you in other labs seen more than just that? In some laboratories, <coughs> yes, specifically in Cellmark in association with this case and at uh, the Department of Justice in association with this case. All right. And in terms of looking, uh, in terms of that data compared to the, the extent of contamination you saw in those laboratories and the extent of contamination at LAPD, how does the LAPD rate? Same objection, no foundation. Sustained. Did you detect contamination at some levels in other laboratories? Yes. All right. Was it at the levels that you found at the Los Angeles Police Department? Same objection. Sustained. Well, let's try it this way. Uh, in your judgment, how serious is this problem of contamination that you found at the Los Angeles Police Department? It's extremely serious. Uh, in terms of speaking as a DNA laboratory director, uh, in terms of uh, the standards used by accrediting groups such as the National Marrow Donor Program, uh, what action would be taken uh, concerning a laboratory that had the level of contamination you found at the LAPD? No foundation calls for speculation. Sustained. Are you familiar with the standards used by organizations such as the National Marrow Donor Program to assess contamination in yes. DNA laboratories? Yes. DNA laboratories that use PCR techniques? Yes. All right. And by those standards, what remedies, are there remedies that accrediting agencies uh, use when they find contamination or other quality assurance problems in laboratories? Yes. What are those remedies? They would shut the lab down with this level of contamination. 
Now, is the LAPD, in terms of levels of contamination, worse than any other forensic laboratory you've ever seen? Definitely, by far. Now, you refer to the uh, validation Um, and you recall, is this the uh, uh, statement concerning PCR method validation training record from the LAPD? Yes, it is. And I call your attention to the statement. Uh, every validation sample either gave the expected typing result or no typing results were observed. At no time was an incorrect typing result observed. All right. Now, uh, did you find looking at the validation samples run um, and comparing it to the uh, chart of knowns, uh, typing results that were not the ones expected. Yes, I did. In how many instances? Five. Uh, well, with respect to the, and did you find, how many errors did you find overall in validation studies and proficiency tests? Five. Five. Uh, could you briefly uh, indicate what those are wh when those occur? Yes, I'll have to refer to my notes. For Please them. do. Yes. Go, please go ahead. Okay. On um, May 25th, 1994, there was a hair shaft had a type recorded as a two, as, uh, rec recorded as a 1.22, and the, share, the hair was a 2.3 hair. So that's an incorrect type. On uh, 9-21-93, there was a vaginal swab standard. The uh, type anticipated was a 1.2, 1.3. It was typed a 1.24. So that is, is an error. Again, on 9-9-93, uh, there was that same standard. Uh, and it should have been typed a 1.24, and it was, no, excuse me, it was should have been typed a 1.2, 1.3, and it was typed as a 1.24. Before you move on, uh, I show you, uh, I'm sorry, I showed it to you before. <clears throat> this is 11, what is previously been marked as 11 a I want to just show you 1181C, B, E, and 1182.
these sheets it's just identified for us. Do uh, you recall uh, the testimony of Mr. Yamauchi with respect to a particular uh, typing he did uh, on one of these validation studies? Yes, I do. All right. uh, is one of the errors that, uh, one of the, the typings that you're calling is an error was one of those performed by Mr. Yamauchi? Uh, yes, it is. All right, and could you identify which of those exhibits represents uh, that particular typing? It's um, Exhibit 1181C. Is that the one that you were just referring to in your notes? <coughs> yes. Just <coughs> Put that, uh, uh, can we bring that back? Could you identify for us which of those is the uh, incorrect typing? It's the second strip down, 19-2 item. And what, and the typing there is recorded as a 1.24? Correct. For the sperm fraction? Correct. And what should it be? It should be a 1.2, 1.3. I do. Now, could you please go on and finish uh, your description of uh, the errors in typing that you observed? Yes. Um, on uh, 7 uh, there was a reference blood sample that was uh, typed in error as a 1.34 when in reality it was a proficiency sample that should have been a 1.24. And again on 7 14 93, uh, that same reference blood sample was again typed as a 1.34 when it should have been a 1.24. Now, did you, uh, in compiling I'm sorry, the, the, the analysis that you've been describing for us, did you uh, uh, compile a, uh, a table uh, with a description of each of the uh, strips you were examining um, and the typing uh, for purposes of putting together these charts? Yes, I did. All right, and uh, did you uh, turn those over to us for us to turn them over to the uh, prosecution? Yes, I did. All right. And, um, uh, that chart, uh, you initially entitled that chart what? Um, or that table of uh, data? I believe it was, I don't have the original in front of me, I believe it was LAPD DQ Alpha contamination events or something of that. And at some point recently, did you just change the title of that chart? Yes, I did. And where did you change it to? I changed it to LAPD DQ Alpha unexpected alleles. And why did you do that? Because this is my raw data, and it really does include uh, that 7.9% of the 1.1s, for instance, that could be explained as DX. And I, my strategy in doing this was to simply record all additional dots that should not be there. This is my raw data. And then to go back to that and analyze the data later. So it was mis it was not correctly titled, and in, in, in the fact that those uh, that minor percentage of uh, one point uh, ones that could have been explained as DX are on this table. Now, uh, in with re with respect to the errors, uh, when you were compiling that table, uh, did and reviewing it before you came here to testify, uh, uh, did you make another change with respect to errors? Yes. And could you explain that to the jury? Yes, originally there was a hair shaft uh, which was from a hair of a 1.2, 1.3 type, and it was called a 1.24, which is an error. However, in the uh, 
typing of that strip, it was recorded by the analyst that there was no C dot. And I felt I could see a C dot, and that's why I recorded it as an error. But in fact, since the analyst recorded no C, um, they would not have interpreted that as an interpretable result, and I decided to uh, not call it an error because they wouldn't. They would not have reported it if they didn't feel they, f they saw the C dot. Okay. Now, um, do you think it's a problem, uh, Dr. Gerdes, uh, for a DNA laboratory uh, not to recognize that it has contamination in its laboratory? Definitely. Do you think it's a problem for a DNA laboratory not to recognize when it is making errors in its own validation study? Uh, I'd like to turn now to the uh, uh, procedures that were used for the collection and handling and processing of uh, samples uh, in this case. And uh, Your Honor, what I'd like to do is go back to um, uh, a set of s uh, slides that we used previously that are marked as 1149A um, that I've shown to uh, Mr. Clark entitled uh, Cross Contamination Factors. We'll see. Could we have the uh, first slide, Mr. Harris? Now, did you identify uh, certain procedures for the collection, handling, and processing of samples by the Los Angeles Police Department that, in your opinion, uh, created risks of cross-contamination and error? I did. All right. Let's turn to 1159B. Now, do you recall the testimony uh, in this case, uh, where uh, Mr. Fung and Ms. Mazzola put wet blood swatches in plastic bags. I recall that. And in your opinion, is putting wet blood swatches in a plastic bag uh, in the fashion that they described they did it in this case? Uh, what consequences can one expect from the point of view of uh, microbiology and molecular biology? Oh. The, uh, you're placing a wet, highly enriched uh, material in a place plastic bag uh, at a, an elevated temperature on that particular day, which is the perfect environment for bacteria to grow. And though, so you're encouraging, uh, under those circumstances, the growth of the bacteria, and the bacteria are going to grow and just eat the DNA. When the bacteria eat the DNA, is that sometimes called degradation? Yes. And that can, uh, as represented in this logo, if we assume that the one represents uh, the DNA type of uh, the blood on that specimen, uh, would that arrow and, and that arrow represents the bacteria eating away at it, all right? Is, yes. is that a fair description of the yes. process we're talking about? In your opinion, was um, uh, there a serious risk of degrading uh, the uh, bundied blood drop samples, LAPD items 47, 48, 49, 50, and 52, 
uh, by the way that they were put in plastic bags uh, in this case. Sustain. All right. What what effect do you believe putting the uh, uh, blood swatches in the plastic bags uh, and then putting them in the truck uh, and then uh, seven hours later after their collection uh, finally removing them and putting them in test tubes? What effect, in your opinion, uh, would putting them in the plastic bag for that period have? Sustain. All right. Uh, are you familiar with the testimony of Mr. Fung and Ms. Mazzola that they collected these samples starting at around 11.30 on uh, June 14th, put them in plastic bags, uh, uh, put them in the evidence truck, and then later at about uh, 6 in the evening finally began the process of removing uh, the wet swatches from the plastic bags and putting them in test tubes? Yes, I'm familiar with that. All right. In your opinion, what effect... Thirteenth, June thirteenth. June thirteenth. Uh, what effect would putting the uh, wet blood swatches in the plastic bag, in your opinion, have, in terms of? Well, it's going to degradation. encourage degradation, as we just. Sustain. All right. Excuse me, counsel. The, the problem is the foundation, as far as criminology, collection of evidence, his familiarity with the techniques, et cetera. That's the problem. Uh, Dr. Gerdes, you got your Ph.D. in microbiology? Yes. All right. What, could you explain to us what uh, a microbiologist does in terms of collecting organisms in a field setting? Well, a microbiologist is familiar with uh, uh, collection techniques for whatever specific bacterium or whatever organism they work with. All right. So, so is this a fundamental part of microbiology? Mm -hmm. And uh, is, does your background in microbiology uh, is part of your basis for your opinion about the effects that uh, uh, putting these blood swatches in a plastic bag would have in terms of the facts of this case? Yes. And based on your background as a microbiologist and a molecular biologist, what is your opinion about the effects of bacterial degradation of red swatches in a plastic bag for the period in question? Uh, the effect would be that it's going to encourage degradation, and the bacteria are, are definitely going to grow and, and degrade the DNA. I think it's about perhaps the eighth time in this case we've heard that. I, I know, but this is the first time from the defense witness. Second time we've heard it from him today. All right, let's move on to slide 11590. Now, uh, E. Now, when DNA samples such as the swatches, the kind of red swatches we're dealing with in this case, when they're degraded, what does that do in terms of the risk of cross-contamination once they are in a DNA laboratory? Objection, no foundation. All right. Uh, do you have familiarity with the processes uh, that were used for handling the swatches in this case? Yes. Are you familiar with uh, the testimony of Mr. Fung and Ms. Mazzola about how they took the red swatches out of plastic bags and placed them in test tubes on the evening of June 13th? Yes. All right. Have you seen their testimony about that? I have. Have you seen the evidence packaging boards that describe that? Yes. All right. Have you, are you familiar with uh, their testimony with respect to the next day, taking the blood swatches out of the tubes and scraping them with my pet, putting them in the white papers that they call bindles, folding them up. I'm familiar with that. Are you familiar with 
uh, how they then put those bindles into coin envelopes. Yes. Are you familiar with the testimony of Mr. Yamauchi <coughs> as to what he did on the morning of June 14th, uh, starting at around 9 a.m. through 11.20 a.m., when he processed the reference sample of Mr. Simpson, the Rockingham glove, and the Bundy swatches 47, 48, 49, 50, and 52. I'm familiar with that. Have you reviewed that testimony? Yes. Uh, now, if one were to assume that the Bundy samples, that is 40, the swatches 47, 48, 49, 50, and 52 were degraded, would that increase the risk of cross-contamination? Well, In your opinion, sir, in terms of the handling of samples in a DNA laboratory, uh, are there problems when one is handling degraded samples with low amounts or no DNA at the same time or period of location when handling samples with high contents of DNA? Yes, there are definitely problems uh, under those circumstances. And uh, is that a situation which increases the risk of cross-contamination? Yes. And why is that? Well, I, I believe at the very beginning of my testimony, I described the fact that if you have something in high concentration next to something in low concentration, the, there's a greater chance that you can get a small amount of material from the, the substance with high concentration into the one with low. And so there's a greater risk of that kind of cross-contamination because you're handling the two at the same time next to each other. And the nodding of the jurors indicate they recollect that from this morning, too. <laughs> and they recollect it from a month ago. That was a month ago. <laughs> now, uh, are there uh, rules or practices, to your knowledge, in uh, the various protocols for handling samples in forensic labs and other DNA laboratories with respect to handling a reference sample in the same location and in the same period as evidence samples? Oh, well. Yes, there are definite and protocols for that. And what, 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 is, what are those protocols and what is your understanding of those practices? What are the rules? The rules are that you never handle a reference sample at the same time as any evidence. Now, when you say at the same time, what are we talking about? Are we talking about, uh, uh, could, could you describe that? Well, it means in the, in, in the, at the same, in, in the same time, I'm sorry. in terms of, Well, same time means uh, in the same setting, I guess, is the way I would describe it. And that doesn't mean uh, that it's in a sequence of events. It means that you don't have, you, you have a, a separation in time by a matter of uh, a span of at least, uh, you know, 20 minutes or a half an hour. There's no really exact time period. But the way it's described in these protocols is that you handle the reference sample, you put it away, you bleach down, you totally clean up, you allow a period of time, and then you can handle evidence. 
in your experience uh, in reviewing the practices at the Cellmark Laboratory, how do they handle reference samples and evidence samples? They were handled at the same time. I'm sorry. At the same time. They were handled at the same time, okay. reference and evidence. Right. And now, what is their current practice? The LAPD? Oh, no, I'm talking about Cellmark. Oh, Cellmark, excuse me. <laughs> Uh, Cellmark never handles reference samples and uh, evidence at the same time. How do they do it? Did they As separate I, it by how, how much of a period? Uh, in, in prior cases, when I've, in, I've inquired of their criminalists, it would be the closest. Sustained. All right. Are you familiar with, uh, uh, do you know according to their uh, protocol, <coughs> withdrawal? Let's get back to LAPD. Um, are you familiar with the testimony of Mr. Yamauchi that at about 9 o'clock, well, let's, take care of all foundational names. Uh, are you familiar with the serology item description notes, which are 1185, I've shown them, Mr. Clark, of Mr. Yamauchi for uh, June 14th, and June 15th, his notes of uh, handling the samples. Yes. All right. Are you familiar with his testimony that between the period of 9 a.m. And 11.20 a.m., he handled Mr. Simpson's reference sample and created a FISCO card. Yes. He ha moved next to the Rockingham glove, did a series of pheno tests and cuttings and initialed that glove. That's correct. Took samples. And then moved on to uh, do the uh, so-called Bundy blood drops items, uh, 47, 48, 49, 50, and 52 familiar with that? I believe the order was 52 and then the others, uh, but the exact sequence is, is different than what you stated, but they, they were done. They handled the Bundy blood drops all within that period? Yes, they did. All right. mm -hmm. Now, in your judgment, was what is your opinion of this laboratory practice of handling Mr. Simpson's reference tubes in the way Mr. Yamauchi described it and these evidence samples within that period? That, that is not uh, an acceptable practice in any forensic laboratory. Why? Because of the unacceptable risk of contamination from the reference sample, which has high levels of DNA, and the evidence items that were processed, which have low levels. Now, do you recall uh, that section of Mr. Yamauchi's testimony where he describes that he opened Mr. Simpson's reference sample and blood came out of the tube that went through the chem wipe and onto his glove. Yes, I, re I recall that. Now, in your experience, when you open one of these vacutainer tubes, what happens or what can happen? Well, you can hear. Oh. You can hear it's a vacutainer. As it, that means it's under vacuum. So you can hear a, a sort of a, it's like opening a coffee can. You can hear it, and there's a, an aerosol that's created. When you say aerosol, what do you mean? Well, aerosol is just very, very small, fine mist of droplets <coughs> that would then spray. Of that's of blood. Of blood, in this case, right. yes. And is, uh, uh, and in terms of the DNA contents of a reference tube, and that aerosol, uh, how does it? What is the nature of the DNA content of uh, of such a well, substance? Well, it doesn't take very much much blood to, to have a substantial amount of DNA. Now, uh, you read Mr. Yamauchi's testimony where he indicated that after he uh, opened the reference tube and the blood went through his chem wipe and went onto his glove, that he then disposed of the gloves, he can't recall, either in the evidence processing room or in the serology lab. That's what I remember, yes. All right. Now, uh, given the nature of his testimony about the way he opened the tube, uh, do you think that what he did next in terms of moving on to the analysis of the other samples was an acceptable laboratory practice? 
No, I mean, be, you, you know you've had a spillage. You, you, you should have basically stopped everything, cleaned down the entire lab, and waited for a period of time before you move on to something as critical as evidence items. All right. Now, <clears throat> the, are you familiar with Dr. Cotton's testimony with respect to the uh, cell mark and the California Association of Crime Lab Directors uh, proficiency study? Yes, I'm familiar with that. And uh, uh, are you familiar with her testimony with respect to how that laboratory got a false positive false positive errors? Yes. Do you think that uh, that has any particular application to this situation we're talking about here, the way Mr. Yamauchi handled Mr. Simpson's reference samples and these samples on the morning of June 14th? There's no foundation for speculation. Sustained. Are you familiar with uh, the – have you read Dr. Cotton's testimony <coughs> with respect to the CACLD study? Yes, I have. All right. Have you looked at uh, – literature uh, and letters with respect to the results of that study? Yes, uh, I'm familiar with it. Is that study discussed in the NRC report? It's discussed in the NRC report. All right. Now, uh, what is it about Dr. Cotton's testimony and her description of those events that you think has application here? Same objection. Sustained. Also irrelevant. Sustained. Ken, is it your understanding that the uh, Selmark made a false positive error uh, even though there were witnesses in the room looking at the transfers? Sustained. Now, could you please describe, just in, in, in simple practical terms, uh, why you have stated that uh, Mr. Yamauchi's practices between 9 o'clock and 11.20 in handling Mr. Simpson's reference sample, the Rockingham glove, and the Bundy blood drops, how, in practical terms, could that cause uh, cross-contamination? Yes, I mean, when you're, you're handling this blood specimen first, and uh, it's been admitted that there was a spillage. Now there's blood on the table. There's an aerosol in the air. Now, just as a hypothetical, uh, Mr. Yamauchi has, we've seen his notes. He was obviously writing with a pen. He may have gotten a little blood on that pen. And then he walks to the other end of the bench carrying the pen. He picks up the pen. Sustain. Answer stricken, jurors to disregard. Let me Put it to you this way. In the process of handling DNA samples, uh, can are mistakes made in terms of cross-contamination that the analyst doesn't realize? Oh. Yes. Uh, call your attention to page uh, 89 of the NRC report. And uh, I'd like to have this marked as At 1299, I believe. I'm sorry, what page, guys? Uh, page 89. And I'm at 1299? 1299. I'm sorry? 1299. 99. Okay. Uh, do you see a uh, – do you agree and would you rely upon the statements at uh, page uh, 89 with uh, formulating your opinions about this case? Yes. As far as – Overall, not as phrased. Uh, what paragraph are we talking about? Uh, It's the first sentence and the beginning of the second paragraph. Yeah. 
Uh, Dr. Gerdes, do you, do you agree with the observation of the NRC there that laboratory errors happen even in the best laboratories and even when the analyst is certain that every precaution against error was taken? I agree with that. Now, Are you f familiar Mr. Yamauchi's diagram of the glove found at Rockingham. Now, <coughs> Dr. Gertie. Dr. Gertie, just take a half a step back, would you please? Thank you. Dr. Gertie, are you familiar with? Uh, Mr. Yamauchi's testimony that after handling Mr. Simpson's reference tube, opening it up, uh, that he, creating the Fitzko card, that he moved to the analysis of the Rockingham glove. Yes. And have you reviewed his notes as to the parts of the glove that he manipulated? Yes. And uh, uh, you're familiar with his testimony as to the initialing that he did in the wrist area of the glove? the sample cutting, the pheno uh, testing, and the spot checks control that he did on the inside Palmer surface and the back side of the glove. Yes. All right. Dr. Gerdes, are you familiar with uh, the results obtained by the Department of Justice using the D1S80 PCR system? Uh, obtaining results consistent with Mr. Simpson's 2425 20, genotype on a section near the wrist area entitled here uh, G10, a section uh, in the area depicted here is G11. G11, and a section indicated on the inside surface near the notch, G13. Yes. All right. Uh, given the manipulations that Mr. Yamauchi performed on the glove, as depicted in his notes, and the DNA test results from the amounts of DNA in that D1S80 system, in your opinion, could they be the result of sample handling error? Objection calls for speculation. Sustained. All right. Is it consistent with this DNA result that, uh, given the amounts of DNA in the D1S80 system, that cross-contamination could have occurred in the areas marked uh, G10, G11, and G13? Same objection. Sustained. Uh, is it a good laboratory practice to have proceeded from handling the reference sample under the circumstances described by Mr. Yamauchi and turn to Manipulation of the wrist area of the glove in the fashion that he described. Objection asked and answered. Oh, uh, it, it represents unacceptable risks of cross contamination. Are the amounts for G10, 
G11 and G13 on the D1S80 system, the amounts of DNA found in those areas, are those amounts consistent uh, with uh, cross-contamination uh, from small amounts of blood? Are the amounts of DNA on the D1S80 results there uh, within the uh, nanogram range uh, between the two, three nanogram range uh, as reflected on the DOJ uh, typing results? Same objection, same ground. Uh, the total amount of DNA there is, is uh, I don't remember exactly the amount, but the point is that's a mixture. And in a mixture, you can't really tell what proportion of the mixture uh, is truly from one contributor or another. Although the D1S80 typing result consistent with Mr. Simpson appears to be a minor contributor. And that is consistent with the possibility of cross-contamination. Now, could we have uh, 11... I think I'm going to order that Mr. Harris not leave the courtroom while we're in session. And Mr. Cochran, it is so ordered. Ah. <laughs> Sorry, Howard. In order, Mr. Harris. All right. Is it a good laboratory practice to handle in the same period in the same location samples that have high DNA content and low DNA content? Sustained. I, I think we have visited that topic now for the second time. All right. Time. Well, let's move to the next one. One question. Is it a good lab, well, maybe not one. Is it a good laboratory practice, sir, to handle in the same period in the same location samples from different scenes? Oral. No, it is not. All right. Are you aware that uh, <coughs> on June 15th, Mr. Yamauchi handled samples from, that included the reference sample from Nicole Brown Simpson, the reference sample from Ronald Goldman, samples from the Bronco, and samples from uh, the Rockingham Foyer LAPD item number 12. Objection, young oh, yes, he handled, handled those at that time. All right. And of course, on June 14th, he handled the Rockingham glove and the Bundy swatches. Correct. Uh, Is it a good idea to handle reference samples from suspects and victims in the same period in the same location? Uh, no, it's not a good idea because of, again, the risk of cross-contamination. Let's move to uh, 1159G. In terms of forensic or clinical laboratory practice or any kind of practice in DNA laboratories, is it a good idea to handle many samples at the same time in a rush? Well, sustained. All right. Also handle many samples at the same time. Also assume that's not evidence. Rephrase. Is it a good idea to handle as many as 20 samples in a short period of time. Sustained. All right. You've heard the testimony about how Mr. Yamauchi uh, sampled and then proceeded to test on June 14th 20 individual samples. Yes. All right. Um, does that seem to you? terms of ordinary laboratory practices um, 
Well, how, in your opinion, what do you think about handling all those samples in the time period he described? It, it seems to be a lot of samples for that time period. All right. Uh, let's turn to 1159H. Now, you've heard testimony with respect to the uh, practices of the LAPD crime laboratory personnel, Mr. Fung, Ms. Mazzola, uh, and Mr. Yamauchi with respect to uh, changing gloves. Are you familiar with that? Yes. All right. Now, uh, as a microbiologist and DNA laboratory director, um, do you believe that analysts handling blood samples should routinely change their gloves between handling each item? Yes, I believe they should do that. And why? Uh, especially with a technique like PCR, this is such a, a sensitive technique, you might not even notice that you have a small amount of blood or even an aerosol of that blood on your glove. And unless you change the glove, you can't eliminate the possibility that you might have transferred that to the next sample. Now, in terms of uh, uh, laboratory paper, are you familiar with the testimony of Mr. Fung and Ms. Mazzola that when the samples were brought into the LAPD laboratory and they were taken out of the plastic bags and put into the test tubes, that they did not change laboratory paper between handling those items? I'm familiar with that. Are you familiar with their testimony that when they took the swatches out of the tubes the next morning and scraped them out with a pipette onto a bindle, that they did not change the laboratory paper between each item? I'm familiar with that. In your opinion, are those sound laboratory practices in terms of the danger of cross-contamination? Yes. That's going to create a, a shower, an aerosol, which is going to fall down on that entire area and can easily be transferring DNA from one item to another. Uh, in terms of aerosols, then, uh, it's another one of our little logos. Um, I take it, wh what was that you were saying about scraping the swatches out of the tubes? Yes, that's going to flake the DNA, and it's going to fall down on that area. And it's not going to fall right down straight onto the bindle. It can fall in that entire area. We've heard some questions being asked in this trial, uh, such as, have you heard them, can DNA fly? Have you heard that? Uh, yes, I have. Now, when aerosols are created of uh, these kinds of particles uh, in a laboratory, Do they just fall right to the ground, or how long do they remain ambient in an atmosphere? There can no foundation calls for speculation to sustain. Are you familiar with uh, the problem of uh, dust or aerosols in DNA laboratories? Yes. Is that a problem encountered in uh, forensic as well as clinical work? In, in, in both areas, and... Uh, Sorry, objection, no foundation. Sustain. All right. In both areas and as the forensic. No. Mm -hmm. Proceed. <clears throat> Are you familiar with Mr. Yamauchi's testimony that in processing the Rockingham glove? and the LAPD items 47, 48, 49, 50, and 52 in the morning of June 14th, that he did not routinely change laboratory paper between those items. Yes, I'm familiar with that. Is that a sound laboratory practice? It creates unacceptable risks. Did you conduct a, a tour of the laboratory at the Los Angeles Police Department? Yes, I did. Did he, he conducted the tour? I'm sorry. I should. Were you allowed to go in? 
Yes, I was. <laughs> and when were you allowed to go in? On how many occasions? Uh, on two occasions. One in December of uh, 94, and the other was in January of 95. Uh, did you get to observe the uh, evidence processing room? Yes. Right. And when <coughs> uh, you went back the second time, you said in what date? I believe it was January 18th. All right. On that occasion, were you uh, uh, were pictures taken? They were. And and who took those pictures? Uh, there were two photographers there. One from uh, uh, the police department and Mark Taylor. And, he and was Mark a Taylor's uh, works for was working with the defense. Mm -hmm. And uh, first, let me just show you this picture. That been previously marked. Oh. <coughs> I think 1300. Mrs. Robertson? 1300? And uh, do you recognize this to be the uh, evidence processing room where, uh, and that table uh, depicted as being the area where Mr. Yamauchi testified he processed the samples on the morning of June 14th? Yes. Right. And you looked around, you're familiar with that room? I am. And that was a part of the basis uh, for your testimony about those procedures that we just reviewed? That's correct. Now. Did you go into the serology laboratory where uh, Mr. Yamauchi and Mr. Matheson work? Yes. All right. And mark this is uh, What is that a picture of, sir? Uh, this is a chemical fume hood. Well, is th that is the hood in the LAPD serology laboratory? Yes, it is. Could you please tell us what a laminar flow hood is? Uh, yes. Uh, in uh, a laminar flow hood, there is a screen along the bottom edge of the hood that draws a curtain of air down across that screen around to the back of the hood and then filters across something called a HEPA filter. And the HEPA filter filters out uh, microscopic particles, dust, uh, <coughs> certain bacteria, and it, it cleans the air. So the idea behind the laminar flow hood is there's this, it actually would have a, a, a window in the front that would lower down all the way down with the exception of just enough room to stick your hands in, about six inches. And then this flow of air flows across your hands and that it basically forms a curtain of air that doesn't allow air from the room to get into the hood and it doesn't allow anything from inside the hood to get out. And it's a hood that's frequently called a, uh, uh, a biosafety cabinet. And the reason for that is it protects the analyst from um, being infected with if there's an infectious agent. So in microbiology or virology, we use these to protect an individual from being exposed to a dangerous agent they're working with. And uh, the other purpose of it is that it prevents anything from the outside from getting in. And so the purpose of that, again, from a microbiology standpoint, is you don't want things floating around on dust, such as spores that, that are of fungi, uh, bacteria, DNA, things that attach to dust and float around. You don't want those contaminating what you're working with. Now this hood here, the chemical fume hood, this hood was designed for the purpose of drawing fumes 
away from a chemist. So if they're working with something that has a noxious smell or something that has a, uh, is, it can be toxic in terms of breathing that in, this hood is designed to pull air from the room into the hood and up an exhaust vent that goes out to the outside of the building. So the purpose of this is to draw air out of the room, through the hood, and then out of the building, and therefore pull the fumes away from the individual who's working. Sorry. So they have two different purposes. Now, uh, let me just show you two other pictures that we'll mm -hmm. mark as 1302 and 1303 of the uh, area around this hood. Uh, this is the uh, workstations that are directed, uh, uh, that are they're found directly across the room from the hood that we just saw a picture of. This is in the LAPD serology. In the LAPD serology lab. And what is this picture? That, that was 1302, Your Honor. This is 1302. Uh, this is looking. Uh, you can see those lab coats on the uh, workstations there. Looking back again across the room, and the hood is located. Uh, about halfway down the room there. Could you, can we just direct an arrow uh, towards the hood so you can, uh, you just point it out. There's a hood right here. Okay. Workstations across. All right, actually, just move the arrow to the right. The right there. No, to the left, to the left end. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> now, when you're talking about air, so in other words, it's this hood in the LAPD. <clears throat> it's a chemical hood that sucks air from that whole area into that workstation ha and up. And correct. Out. That's okay. correct. Now, you've heard the testimony in other forensic laboratories, as well as clinical laboratories, that you visited, do they use laminar flow hoods? That's the appropriate hood to use if you are concerned about protecting an analyst and protecting a specimen from microbiological contamination. Laminar flow hoods or DNA contamination. Laminar flow hoods used in forensic labs. Yes. Is this a is the use of a knowing that you have a laminar flow hood as opposed to a chemical hood? Is a is this a fundamental piece of information in terms of DNA laboratory practices? Sustain. All right. Um, is it a fundamental fact in terms of DNA laboratory procedures to know if a hood is a laminar flow hood as opposed to a chemical hood? Sustain. All right. Um, have you heard the testimony or familiar with the testimony of Mr. Yamauchi, Mr. Matheson, that this hood is a laminar flow hood? Yes. Are they correct in their statement that it's a laminar flow hood? No. What does that indicate to you about the level of expertise they have in terms of DNA typing? Sustain. Did you, uh, look at these two. Do you have an opportunity to look at the uh, refrigerator within the serology laboratory? I did. All right. And did you observe there uh, items stored by Mr. Yamauchi, case items? Yes. All right. <clears throat> you have directed photographs be taken of that? I did. All right. I'd like to mark what is, I guess we're 1304. 1305. 
All right, Mr. Sheck, five minutes. We also have a printout that I'd like with the laminar flow hood and mark 13038. Chemical. Chemical. Uh, chemical hood. Chemical. See, it's an easy mistake. Chemical slash laminar. All right. All right, show you first uh, 1305. What's that? Uh, this is a view of uh, Mr. Yamauchi's uh, evidence storage uh, shelf. <clears throat> That's within the serology freezer? That's correct. Right. Refrigerator. Refrigerator. What is uh, 1304? That's a close-up of the rack that was sitting there on that shelf. All right. Now, uh, mm -hmm. how should tubes, test tubes, that contain samples, the forensic lab or DNA lab, uh, be kept. 